All right, I'd like to have you open your Bibles to Psalm 40, and I'm going to uh, point out one verse from one of the great Psalms of David, a psalm that is a psalm of declarative praise. Um, psalm 40 was written uh, by David following a time of intense prayer, and uh, when he felt that um, uh, only God could meet his needs, and yet God hadn't met his need uh, for a period of time. And then, of a sudden, God answered his prayer, and he did so in such an overwhelming way that in verse 3, and this is the verse I want to focus on, David says that this answer to prayer from God has put a new song in my mouth of praise to our God, and many will see it and will fear and will trust in the Lord. Now for David, uh, this was not his coming to faith. For David, this was a, an opportunity to renew his commitment to God and uh, to renew his uh, opportunities of praise uh, of God. But that verse became the life verse of my father, and he related it to his conversion story, and that's the story I want to tell you today. Uh, the Billy Graham team uh, was in Boise, Idaho about 20 years ago, and they um, uh, were going to do two cities back to back, Boise and Spokane in the American Northwest. And one of our best friends from Bible school days, uh, Carl Johnson, was the local leader for the Billy Graham Crusade. He was the lay leader. And he worked on that for a year. In fact, uh, he nearly lost his job uh, because he worked so hard on the preparations for the crusade. Um, and a few weeks before it began, he called us, and we were living in Portland at the time, and he said, Ron, why don't you and Bev come to our home uh, during the opening nights of the crusade, and I'll see that you get to have a seat right on the platform with Billy Graham. And I thought, boy, that's worth a trip to Boise. <laughs> so um, we drove uh, that day, it's a long, long drive, and met Carl and Helen, our dear friends, and my wife went with Helen to the near audience area, and I went with Carl to the room where people were being uh, given instructions on how to behave on the stage. Uh, <laughs> Uh, keep your feet down <laughs> if you cross your legs. Um, uh, don't expose your calf. <laughs> uh, don't chew gum. Uh, look interested. I mean, great talk. I want to, I'd like our faculty to learn so that. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was really fun to hear the kinds of things they were being told. But then I noticed a commotion over by the door, and there was my friend Carl and a uniformed and armed guard, armed guard and they were motioning for me to come over. So I did. I walked over to where they were, and uh, Carl introduced me to this guard, and then the guard said, do you have any ID? And I showed him my driver's license, and then he said, um, I hate to have you do this, but there's a reason for it. Will you please spread eagle against the wall? Well, I watch television. <laughs> so I did, and he patted me down, and then he went over me with a wand, like they'll do at an airport, and uh, he says, well, you're clean. And I thought, well, it's been a 10-hour drive, I'm not sure. <laughs> and he said, no, now follow me. And uh, so I went down one hall and another, and then into an open area where there was a, uh, a small mobile home. And he knocked on the door, and then I heard the voice I heard all my life say, come in. And my friend Carl had worked out a private interview with Billy Graham for me. And, um, you know, for a Baptist preacher, uh, that's the equivalent of a Catholic having an audience with the Pope. <laughs> this was just incredible. And he said, uh, come on in, Ron. May I call you Ron? And I said, certainly, Dr. Graham. <laughs> and he says, take off your coat and, and uh, sit down and relax. And he says, I want to talk to you about your father's song. And uh, so we did that. And uh, it was about 25 minutes. And then there was a voice that came over a speaker embedded in the wall above my head. And it said, uh, Dr. Graham, it's time for you and your guest to go out onto the platform. And I thought, you and your guest, isn't this great? <laughs> when will I get it? I can tell the guys at seminary where I've been. <laughs> so I followed him out, and the program had already been going on. His doctors at that time were restricting the amount of time he was actually on the platform. Anyway, I followed him out, and he sat in the uh, front row center, 
And then next to him on the right was my friend Carl. And then there was the seat for me. And uh, beside me to my right was Sandy, can you believe it, Patty? I thought, this is just too great. <laughs> and uh, then there was music. And, um, and just before the sermon, as he always does, then George Beverly Shea got up and started to walk across the platform. He was seated on the very far seat on the front row on the left. And when he stood up, I heard the piano player and the organist begin the introduction to my father's song. And I couldn't believe it, that it was that night. And I knew that uh, Shea sings my uh, dad's song. He uh, had written me one time. And he said, I sang it in every crusade once. And of all things, the night I was there, that's when he was singing it. So when he started to sing, and Billy Graham realized what had happened, he reached around my friend Carl, and he grabbed my left arm, and he said, this is really special, isn't it? Now, that's all it took, and I started bawling. <laughs> and I saw my wife with Helen destroying a box of Kleenex. This was just uh, an amazing night. So when he finished singing, then Bev Shea uh, went and sat down way at the far end of the platform, and then Billy Graham came up and uh, put his hands on the pulpit like he does, but he didn't start his sermon. Instead, he looked around to where Bev Shea was, and then he turned around and made a big deal of looking to where I was, and then he turned around and looked to him again, and he said, um, he says, Bev Shea, when you started singing, I found a friend tonight. You had no idea, did you, that the son of the composer, Barclay Allen, is seated right here. And uh, he did a double take, and uh, he stood up, and Billy Graham just waited, and he walked across the platform, it was a long walk, and he came over to where I was, and um, uh, I stood up, and he gave me a big bear hug, and then he said, um, oh, this is so terrific that you were here. He said, um, um, would you care to join me for dinner tonight after the meeting? And I said, well, we would planned to go bowling. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, anyway, after the meeting, <laughs> uh, my wife Beverly and I and our friends Carl and Helen and another couple, uh, John and Evie, uh, all Bible school friends from a long time ago, uh, we went out to eat with uh, George Beverly Shea in a Mexican restaurant. And I remember we closed the place. We were there until they kicked us out. And he told us stories about his growing up, about his conversion, about joining the grand team, and then about uh, singing my dad's song. And I told him I was writing my dad's story. And he said, oh, may I write the foreword to it, uh, which he did. So what I want to do today is to tell you the story of uh, the writing of this song, my father's song. And because his name <laughs> is a name that uh, you don't know, I'm going to just leave it up there for a long time so you'll remember it. So my father's name was Barclay Allen. Uh, my dad was born into a home that was filled with music. Uh, his mother had been a classical pianist, a concert artist, and a music teacher. And then um, my grandfather was a barber, and believe it or not, sang in a barbershop quartet. <laughs> But my grandmother was the real musician. She was a brilliant mu musician and a highly sought after uh, piano teacher. And uh, one day, though, she suffered a minor stroke. And she was confined to her bed for a number of weeks. Um, in the period of her recovery, she tells a story that was written in the Rocky Mountain News article that she began to hear a musical theme played slowly and haltingly. And as she was getting better, so was it. And one day, she came to the head of the stairwell and looked down. And the um, housekeeper and nanny that they'd hired to take care of their little boy in my grandmother's uh, illness was holding the 18-month-old boy on the piano bench, studying him. And with one finger, he was slowly uh, picking out the melody line of humoresque. And my grandmother had this flash of uh, memory. And she remembered that at the time she had her uh, stroke, that was the song she'd been playing. And this little boy <laughs> had picked out the melody line. 
And she was just overcome uh, with that. And, and so she began pouring all of her life of music uh, into his life. And it's a long story, but uh, in a couple of sentences, in junior high, she had him taking uh, lessons on nine different instruments. She felt one day he'd compose and uh, certainly do arranging, and he had to know how instruments worked, she said. <laughs> when he was in high school at Manual Arts High in Denver, uh, he was first chair violinist in the school orchestra, first chair trumpet player in the school band. He led a dance band Friday and Saturday nights, and on Sunday morning, he played organ in a large church in uh, Denver. So that his life was just a life of music. Now, my grandmother was a strict disciplinarian, and she had one view of music, and it was classical. And my father began listening to the radio against her wishes, and he got really interested in the popular music of his day. And that's a long time before the popular music of your day. <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, big band swing music. And uh, he heard a pianist, his name is Teddy Wilson, and he just thought this was uh, the kind of music that he wanted to play. So when he graduated from high school, my father did two, two things. Um, one, he and my, the woman who became my mother married right out of high school. And then my father broke his mother's heart by uh, turning down a full scholarship uh, to Juilliard. Um, and instead, he took a job at a radio station um, as um, the morning show band leader. And uh, in those days, uh, radio stations that played recorded music had to have a certain number of hours of a live band. That was a union rule that made a lot of work for musicians. So if you think of a morning talk show that you listen to driving in someplace, well, in Denver in those days, uh, there were uh, talk hosts, but they would have music going on as well. And they talked to the musicians, and it was kind of a fun deal. And so my dad had the morning drive-in show on KLZ, a major station in Denver. Um, in the war years, now this is World War II. <laughs> this is a long time ago. <laughs> in, in the war years, my father was not in the military service. Uh, earlier in his life, he had fallen off a porch and broken his right ankle. And it never healed properly, so he was uh, not um, drafted. But uh, he kept his um, radio program, but then during the day, he played piano at a defense plant, and they piped the music through the plant. So that was his service, such as it was. Now, when World War II was over, as soon as people could travel, uh, our family moved to uh, California. So I was born in 41, my sister in 43. Uh, you don't need to know how old I am, but I cannot believe that my sister Peggy is 63 years old. <laughs> That's just hard for me to believe, that little Peggy is 63. Oh, gasp. So I'm there somewhere, I guess, as well, aren't I? In any event, we uh, moved in 1945 to um, North Hollywood, uh, California, and my dad wanted to make it big in the music business. And uh, he had a number of friends, a lot of things are done by networking, and. One of his friends from Denver who'd come out ahead of him, uh, Rock Hillman, became uh, very close. And he became later the lyricist with my father and a lot of music. And Rock Hillman introduced my uh, father to Jane Russell. Some of you may have heard that name. Uh, she was a movie star. Uh, in later years, uh, late night television, she was in ads uh, showing certain women's foundation garments. <laughs> but what you may not know is that um, this extremely uh, beautiful woman was a wonderful singer. And my father was her accompanist for a period of time. And um, that was an entree into the music world in Hollywood. But his big break came, as they used to say, uh, when he got a phone call from Freddie Martin's secretary. Uh, you won't know that name, perhaps, but he was a big band leader in the 30s and 40s. And um, his band was ideal for my dad. Uh, he always had, uh, he always featured a piano player, but he always featured one who was classically trained, but who could do dance band rhythms. And before my father, there were two very famous uh, pianists with him, Murray Arnold and Jack Fina. And uh, Freddie's theme song was taken from a Tchaikovsky piano concerto in B flat. And the melody line became his uh, big hit 
It's called um, Tonight We Love. And in that, you hear these wonderful uh, chords, and uh, that's my dad on those records. And we have them all. And um, my dad uh, traveled with Freddie for months across the country by bus. They did a lot of recording. At home, we have a stack of records, a shelf, uh, 78. It's almost three feet across. And on the um, label, it says, Barclay, uh, says uh, Freddie Martin's Orchestra with Barclay Allen at the piano. Mm -hmm. Now, all this is talk, so I want you to hear one of his songs. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a song, uh, my father wrote a song called Kumana. Uh, it's still played all over the world. We still get uh, royalties from it, my mother and my sister and I. And the royalties are not what they used to be, but we still get uh, several checks a year. It's just astonishing. But this song was written in 1947, and you're going to hear the original recording. Uh, my dad's at the piano, it's his song, and it's with Freddie Martin's big band, okay? And while you hear this, I'll show you some pictures from the time. Uh, that record that you just heard sold uh, over a million copies in 1947, when that was a very big number. And uh, with that, and uh, some of the other songs that my father recorded, uh, he showed up at our front porch one day when the band was in New York. And my mother looked at him. She says, what has happened? Did you quit? Were you fired? And he says, I've come home to start my own band. And she couldn't believe it. Uh, Downbeat said he was the highest paid sideman in the business. And uh, now he's coming home to start his own band. She just thought that was nuts. So, um, but that's what he did. And he got a terrific personal manager named Carson Harris and uh, wonderful musicians, the nucleus was his quartet. And um, then because of Carson, uh, my dad's band opened at a place called Ciro's in Hollywood. And in those days, bands would play for years, hoping one day they could uh, be booked at Ciro's, and dad's band opened there. And Peggy Lee, you just saw her picture, she was the headliner. And my mother uh, still talks about that opening night. I uh, visited my mother. Uh, shortly before coming here uh, for this semester. And I talked to her a little bit about it again, and she gets a smile on her face, and she says, oh, Ronnie, she says, uh, Peggy Lee, and, uh, and she sang with your dad's band, and that was such a big deal, and Frank Sinatra was there, and um, she says, I shook hands with Perry Como, and uh, she says, I didn't wash my hand for three days. <laughs> Now, I'm shameless in dropping names. I'm just dropping them left and right without regard for decency. But I want you to know that I know that none of the names of passing celebrity that I mentioned um, compares at all with the name of Jesus, which is the big name I'm talking about, as you'll see. But in any event, uh, that was the beginning. And uh, then the, the band left on a road trip for two years. And um, uh, the plan was that they would go by bus, the way Freddie Martin's band traveled. But my mother put her foot down. She says, absolutely not. She said, you traveled for um, uh, months with Jane Russell and her entourage, and then you traveled for months with Freddie's band. And she says, if you're going off for two years, we're all going, and we're going to go as families in family cars. So that was very unusual, but they thought it was a good idea. And uh, the way it worked is the drummer in my dad's band was a teacher certified uh, by the state of California. So he got permission to be teacher of record. And our mothers, there were several children among the band families, our mothers did lessons with us. And before there was homeschool, we had hotel school. <laughs> and uh, for two years, I had, um, uh, my mom was my teacher. And, um, and we would uh, take standardized exams. and. Uh, uh, that's how we did it. We did it on the road. And uh, the hotels that we were in were the grand hotels, the great hotels of um, the 40s and 50s. Uh, we were in the Palmer House in Chicago and the Chase Hotel in St. Louis and the Peabody in Memphis. And every hotel he was booked at for a few months and it would be extended over several more months. And um, for me, it was just an unbelievably a wonderful childhood. <laughs> uh, I didn't have any dishes to do, uh, either to wash or to dry. Every meal was eaten out in a hotel. You believe that? And um, I didn't have a bed to make or toys to pick up, 
daily maid service. Are you following me in this? <laughs> I mean, I just like a pampered little rich kid um, because um, the, as the band leader's family, we stayed in a suite in the hotels. The other bandsmen had to find hotel rooms off site, but uh, we had this suite and sometimes Peggy and I each had our own private rooms and uh, you know, there were fresh flowers in the living room every day. Uh, talk about a life, this was unbelievable. Uh, for my mother, though, it was um, more difficult than she thought it would be. Uh, she didn't have any meals to prepare, and she didn't have any meals to prepare. <laughs> she didn't have any housekeeping to do, and she didn't have any housekeeping to do. And she wasn't working. Uh, she just was with my sister and me uh, all day long. And um, so she started to look for meaning in her life, and she bought one day an Edgar Myers Bible storybook. And she read it aloud to my sister and me, twice, cover to cover. And uh, then, when we were in St. Louis, the uh, woman vocalist in my father's band uh, began pressuring my mother to take us to, to church or Sunday school. Now think about that for a moment. This is a dance band singer, and she's mad at the uh, director's wife because the kids aren't in Sunday school. And one day, there was a little placard on the lobby desk saying that there was a class for children, uh, a Bible class, near the hotel. So my mother took us there, and it must have been a child evangelism class. And I still remember a flannel graph board, never seen that before, and a big heart and a door and a shiny knob, and a figure of Jesus knocking at the door. And I know, I know I teach at Dallas Seminary, but she used a verse from Revelation chapter 3, and she says, all you need to do is open the door and Jesus will come in and live with you forever. And that night, while my parents were fighting in their room about my father's increasing drinking problem, I prayed in my room the prayer that she taught me that morning, and I became the first in our family to come to faith in Jesus. Well, that was wonderful, but um, things were not good with my folks at all. My father had begun to drink very heavily, and he began to flaunt the fact that he was repeatedly unfaithful to my mother. Mm -hmm. And she finally just felt she couldn't do it anymore. And uh, we were in New York, and um, she had us pack up our stuff, and we flew to Denver, we stayed with friends for a while, and then we flew to California, and my mother was gonna start her life over, uh, separated, and probably she would divorce my dad. Well, the band came west, and they came through Seattle and Portland and down to San Francisco where they played the Mark Hopkins Hotel, the top of the mark. But they're on their way to the big booking that Carson had been working on for months, and it was where my father would have the house band at the then largest casino in Las Vegas for more money, Downbeat Magazine said, than any band had ever been paid any place, any time. It was a huge contract, and the last stop before arrival in Las Vegas was the Cal Naval Lodge on the California-Nevada border at Lake Tahoe, North Shore. Uh, my wife and I visited there a year ago, and uh, the ballroom there today at the Cal Naval Lodge is called the Frank Sinatra Memorial Ballroom, and uh, the reason for that is Sinatra in those days had a chalet very near there and would often come down and sing. And on August the 17th, 1949, my father spent the day with Frank Sinatra at his chalet, and they were uh, talking over about uh, the good fortunes of the band and how it had done in these two years of this road trip, and this huge booking that they had in Las Vegas, which was gonna be probably the career path for my dad. And, and uh, they drank a lot that day, and then when it was time for the show, uh, Sinatra joined my father and uh, sang that night. And that was a big crowd pleaser. My father kept drinking. And um, then he got in a snit with someone after the show was over in the wee hours. And he got in his car and he decided to drive to Reno alone in the dark after drinking all day long. And he had a brand new uh, Buick Roadmaster with four holes. It was about four weeks old. And uh, he was driving to Reno, and he fell asleep at the steering wheel. 
Even today, the Truckee River Highway is a windy road, but then it was narrower and the curves were sharper. And uh, he went through an embankment and um, had a horrible accident. Uh, the next day, a man and woman who were fishing along the stream discovered him, and they flagged down a car, and he was rushed to the Washoe County Hospital in Reno. Uh, the drummer in our, my dad's band, uh, Merle Mahone, he was taken to the accident site, and uh, highway patrolmen showed him what happened. My dad had fallen asleep, and he'd uh, let his, uh, the car miss a turn, and he drove through a wooden barricade, and when he went through the barricade, uh, he knocked a large boulder loose, and then the car plummeted 18 feet down an embankment. The boulder tumbled with him and the car. This is long before seat belts, and he was partially thrown out of the car through the door, and uh, the car came down, the boulder and my dad, and somehow the boulder kept the car from flattening him. Um, but from his broken wristwatch, they knew he had lain there for five and a half hours before he was discovered. Well, I remember the phone call that came to our home uh, that morning, that Saturday morning. My mother screamed. She started crying, running around the house, uh, doing things, making calls. And a taxi cab came, and a lady got out with her suitcases, and my mom hugged us and got on with hers, and she flew to Reno to be with my dad. And uh, when she got there, she rushed into the hospital room, and my father was upside down in a striker frame, um, that is to rotate uh, the body, and, um, he would, but he was upside down, and he was in the process of swallowing his tongue. And um, he, his, he was blue, and my mother screamed, nurse came in, they called a code, but my father survived. Then my mother learned what had happened. In addition to bruises and contusions and all manner of uh, broken things, he had uh, he'd broken his neck and injured his spinal column, and he was paralyzed from this level down and would be the rest of his life. And um, it was a few weeks before he turned 30, his 30th mm -hmm. birthday. And now all of a sudden, Everything is over. Mm -hmm. Now, when um, Christopher Reed uh, became paralyzed from his horseback uh, accident, uh, I, am, uh, I was absolutely astonished at his positive response to his um, injury. Uh, he, um, he, he was uh, truly an, an example of courage in uh, catastrophe. Uh, my father was not Superman uh, uh, at all. Uh, he was the opposite of Christopher Reed. Um, the one thing my father did well was play the piano. And uh, his mother had made that the center of his life. And uh, he was her little Mozart. And, and the, that was the one thing he did well. And now that was gone. And with that gone, he decided he really didn't want to live. And, um, and he just turned, uh, went into a blue funk. And um, after a number of weeks of treatment in Reno, he was flown by a hospital plane to Burbank, California, near our home, where he was put in the St. Joseph's Hospital and he was there for 21 months. Can you imagine that? Now, many of you know the story of, uh, of Johnny. Uh, Johnny had her rehabilitation at a hospital called Rancho Los Amigos. And I've talked to her about this. Rancho Los Amigos um, is the finest hospital in the country for spinal cord injuries. And uh, Johnny has had the life and ministry she's had because of the superb <coughs> care she had there shortly after her terrible accident. But my father couldn't get into Rancho Los Amigos. That hospital was built for World War II service-connected disabilities. And my father's spinal injury wasn't because <coughs> He'd been in the Army or the Navy. It's because he was a drunk driver who hadn't been in the service at all. So uh, at that time, in the late 40s, uh, that hospital was still filled with World War II servicemen, which it was built for. So he never got the treatment that he might have gotten and that uh, Johnny, we thank God, did get. And uh, so I say that to say that in the 21 months <coughs> of his hospitalization, he went from 200 pounds down to 87 pounds, mm -hmm. literally. And um, we have a couple of pictures of him at his worst, at his nadir. 
and I, I can bear, I can't look at them. He, he just looks like skin tautly stretched over bone. And, um, but he just, um, he just didn't want to live. Now my mother was met at the airport at, um, in Burbank uh, when we were flown there by um, the pastor of the church of the woman who was taking care of my sister and me while my mom was in Reno with my dad. And uh, he was a wonderful evangelist, a Lutheran pastor. His name is Norman Hammer. And he invited my mother not only to church but to a Bible class for adults on Saturday mornings for people who didn't know much about the Bible, he said. And on the third Saturday morning when he was explaining justification by grace through faith, my mother came to faith and shortly after my sister. Now Pastor Hammer tried to meet with my dad. And every time he tried to meet with my dad, he was rebuffed. My dad didn't want to see him. He, he'd tell me, I'd say, Dad, um, yeah, you should let Pastor Hammer tell you about Jesus. And he says, Ronnie, you're a boy. You, you can do that. And, and your mother, she's weak. She needs that. Boy, what a silly statement that is in retrospect. But he says, for me, religion is strictly C melody. He just didn't want anything to do with me. And um, so my mother tried to get him, but it was just, he just wouldn't talk to him. Pastor had a wonderful sense of humor. He'd tell a joke at a nurse's station, and his laughter'd come rolling down the hall. My dad would hear it. And then he'd uh, tell a nurse, quick, uh, tell that preacher I'm dead, or tell him I'm in therapy, but don't tell him I'm here. And pastor would come and he'd open the curtain and he'd come into my dad's room and my dad would pretend to be asleep. And he'd say, come on, Bark, I know you're awake. I heard you yelling at the nurse. <laughs> and my dad would say, listen, I understand there's a guy named Bill. He's on the third floor. He can use your help. Go see him. <laughs> Don't bother me. Anyway, that's sort of the way it went. Well, then there came a day where there was another phone call, like the first. And uh, this call, uh, someone from the hospital phoned my mother early one morning and said, Mrs. Allen, we know you come every evening to see Mr. Allen, but we're asking you to come uh, this morning. Um, he's out of the coma he's been in, but his vital signs are weak, and we're not sure he's going to survive the day, and he's asking to see you. So my mother, crying, called Pastor Hammer, and uh, they went together. And uh, I uh, have talked with my mother about this. I've talked with Pastor Hammer about it. And um, this is almost verbatim what, take pl what took place. First, my mother went into the room. And my father was very weak. But he said, please take my hand in yours. And he said, uh, I feel that I'm dying today. And I can't die without first um, asking you to forgive me for the awful way I've treated you in our marriage. Um, I wasn't faithful to you, I've been unkind to you, and I'm just consumed with guilt, and I can't die without telling you I am sorry that I really do love you, even though I haven't shown it uh, well in years. And my mother began to cry, and oh, Bark, she said, and, and uh, if, you're, if you really love me and the children, as you say, why are you trying so hard to leave us? And then he said what he'd said since the beginning, because without music, there's no point in me living. And so my mom went out. Then the pastor said, I'm going in. And the doctor tried to stop him, saying, I don't think he wants you in there. <laughs> pastor said, well, I don't think too much of him right now either, but she wants me in there, so I'm going in. So he came in, and um, he made a point of coming up very close to the uh, bed and pressing against it. He knew from the past that if he bumped the bed, my father would go into horrible muscle spasms, but he just leaned against it so my dad couldn't ignore him. And my dad looked at him, and um, the pastor said to him, well, old buddy, maybe we ought to start taking care of your widow and orphans. And that kind of shocked my dad, and he kind of shook his head. And, and um, then Pastor said, you know, old buddy, if you really knew where you were going, you wouldn't be in such a hurry to get there. <sighs> and my dad got red with rage. And 
finally sputtered out, what right do you have to talk to a dying man like that? And Pastor said, I tell you what, old buddy, if you're still around tomorrow at this time, I'll answer that and any other question you might have. And with that, he walked out of the room. <laughs> and uh, the doctor shook his head, and my mom and pastor got down on their knees and began to pray. And after a long silence, my dad called out to my mom, Van, my mother's name, Van, bring a pad, bring a pen. I got a lot of questions for that blankety-blank preacher of yours. <laughs> Hello, I'm the real Barclay Allen. And I'm Norm Hammer. I was fighting mad at the preacher, and all night long I thought of questions. Without my knowing it, why, he had given me an incentive to live through the night. The next morning, I shot a million questions at him, and Pastor Hammer always knew the right answers. Didn't you, Norm? Well, Bark, occasionally you stump me. But there's one place where you can always find the answer. My friends thought Norm had been rougher on me than a pastor had any right to be, but they were wrong. Time and time again, he had tried to reach me with love and understanding of my need, but that approach didn't work. God used Norm and my wonderful sweet wife, Van, to show me how to live. But it wasn't easy for Barclay. There was no sudden miracle which eased the pain. But God did give me the fortitude to put up with it. There was no sunburst of energy in which my paralyzed muscles came to life, but he did help me find the patience for the long struggle. Nor was there an immediate determination to find and live a useful life. I heard a multiple recording by Les Paul and his guitars, and I felt that I might be able to do the same thing with the piano. So RCA Victor agreed to try it, and the result was Cherokee and After You've Gone. I never will forget the day I called on Barclay, and he told me he'd written a new song. The old Barclay was gone. I saw a new Barclay, full of eagerness for life and accomplishment. I'd expected something like Barclay's Boogie or Kumanal. Instead, it was the beautifully modern hymn, I Found a Friend, words by Rock Hillman. You've probably heard it. Joe Stafford, George Beverly Shea, and Kenny Baker have all recorded it. You see, our point in telling you Barclay's story is this. No matter what your life has been in the past, no matter what you have done, you can throw away your mistakes. And because God forgives, you can be born again. And to be born again means to have a new life. And here's a man who has a brand new life. I certainly have. And being born again is the greatest thing that can happen to anyone. I was burdened with guilt, but when I saw in God's holy word that Christ died for my sins, I took God at his word, and he forgave me. Something wonderful happened inside, and I've been different ever since. It happened to me. I hope you'll let it happen to you. This is the song. Uh, I found a friend, and uh, Chaplain Bill sang it uh, in chapel on Wednesday, and his wife Shirley accompanied him. So this is the song. Well, that song uh, is the song that Bev Shea has sung in every Graham crusade since 1953, and that's the song that Billy Graham talked to me about, and uh, it's the song that's uh, just animated our family. And uh, did you hear the opening words? I found a friend when life seemed not worth living. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a friend so tender and forgiving, I can't conceive that such a thing could be that Jesus died for even me. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this film was made of his life, and uh, it's a short film, 30 minutes, was shown on CBS. And then he got a copy of it, and he would show that in churches all over Southern California, usually in evening service, and would play and sing, and uh, there were many, many people who came to know Jesus as Savior through that. And uh, he, uh, this is Mrs. Hammer, Virgie Hammer, 
And uh, so that was really a wonderful, wonderful ministry. And he would use this song, uh, uh, this verse from Psalm 40. He's put a new song in my mouth of praise to our God. Many will see it and will fear and will trust in the Lord. But he would always end his story by saying well, there's a danger in telling a dramatic story of conversion like mine. He'd say some hearing it are going to think, oh, I don't have a great story like that. And he'd say, your story is probably better because you may have come to faith in the context of a warm, nurturing Christian home. And you came to Christ as a very young person. And you have the whole of your life to give to him. And then he'd point at the wheels on his chair and he'd say, it's for me all I have are the broken pieces. Well, dear Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share this um, story tonight, and I pray it will be received as it's intended, as praise to Jesus. Uh, that's the great name, and all other names are passing celebrity, uh, but yours is the great name, and we thank you that uh, you're the one who reaches down to hurting people and shows, uh, uh, and, shows uh, and you show yourself to be their great Savior. Pray that in Jesus' name.